The conference will begin shortly. To raise your hand during Q&A, you can dial star 11. The conference will begin shortly. To raise your hand during Q&A, you can dial star 11. The conference will begin shortly. To raise your hand during Q&A, you can dial star 11.
The conference will begin shortly. To raise your hand during Q&A, you can dial star 11. The conference will begin shortly. To raise your hand during Q&A, you can dial star 11. The conference will begin shortly. To raise your hand during Q&A, you can dial star 11. Good day, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Landing Tree Incorporated third quarter 2022 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone, and you will then hear an automated message advising your hand is raised. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded and I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Andrew Wessel. Andrew, please go ahead. Thank you and good morning to everyone joining us on the call this morning to discuss LendingTree's third quarter 2022 financial results. 
On the call today are Doug Lebda, Lending Tree's Chairman and CEO, J.D. Moriarty, President of Marketplace and COO, Trent Ziegler, CFO, and Scott Perry, President of Insurance. As a reminder to everyone, we posted a detailed letter to shareholders on our Investor Relations website earlier today. And for the purposes of today's call, we will assume that listeners have read that letter and will focus on Q&A. Before I hand the call over to Doug for his remarks, I remind everyone that during today's call, we may discuss lending trees' expectations for future performance. Any forward-looking statements that we make are subject to risks and uncertainties, and lending trees' actual results could differ materially from the views expressed today. Many, but not all, of the risks we face are described in our periodic reports filed with the SEC. We will also discuss a variety of non-GAAP measures on the call today, and I refer you to today's press release and shareholder letter both available on our website for the comparable GAAP definitions and full reconciliations of non-GAAP measures to GAAP. And with that, Doug, please go ahead. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you to thank you to everybody for joining us on the call today. Our company continues to respond to the multiple headwinds facing us by focusing on what we can control to improve performance and advance our strategy. The most important item we can control are the projects we spend time working on. Our core growth initiatives that will dramatically improve the user experience remain front and center for all of us. The product of an improved customer experience is greater loyalty, generating organic traffic growth that reduces our reliance on paid search, as well as higher conversion rates and monetization for us and our lending partners. We are working to transform the margin profile of our marketplace by presenting customers with the right offer for a financial product when it is most relevant to them. A key component of that strategy is reinvesting in our brand. We return to TV advertising this quarter with a celebrity-driven campaign. Initial results are very positive, showing market improvements in several aspects of brand health and aided customer awareness of LendingTree. As previously communicated, we expect to remain on the sidelines during the fourth quarter due to the normal cycle of seasonally more expensive media and weaker customer focus on financial products during the holiday periods. Another area that is within our control is our operating expense. Subsequent to quarter end, we took further action to manage our fixed costs that will result in $25 million of annualized savings beginning next year. We've reduced our headcount by 20% since the peak in mid-2021 through targeted workforce reductions and limiting hiring to critical roles on growth projects. We remain well-resourced to continue this critical work for our strategic initiatives and to support our marketplace business. On our last call, I discussed how we are working alongside our partners to help them navigate difficult market conditions. I mentioned our efforts to assist some of our largest mortgage lenders roll out home equity offerings for homeowners that today are enjoying record levels of asset value that they can efficiently borrow against. We are happy to report these efforts helped to lead another record lead to another record revenue quarter for our home equity offering. Strengthening our partnerships during the hard times has proven paramount to our success, and we will continue to work on improving these relationships. The consumer segment was again our best performer this quarter, as personal and small business loans grew revenues 12 and 8 percent over the prior year, respectively. We also added a new personal loan and credit card partner to our tree call platform. We expect to make an existing product introduction soon that is a direct result of our strategic initiatives aimed to deepen the relationship with our customers while helping them improve their personal finances. The insurance team provided another example on focusing on what is within their control this quarter. As their business continues to endure the impact of inflationary headwinds, the insurance team's work on improving marketing efficiency generated 4.6 percentage points of margin expansion, expansion sequentially from the second quarter, holding VME flat despite a drop in revenue. I'm excited about the opportunity ahead of us. Executing on our strategy will help us reinvigorate revenue and margin growth and lead us into the next successful iteration lending tree. Now, operator, I'd love to open the line for questions. You. And at this time, we'll conduct the question and answer session. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star one, one on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster.
All right. And our first question comes from Ryan Tomasello of KBW. Uh, please proceed with your question. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking the question. Um, last quarter, you talked about uh, the prior 4Q EBITDA guidance um, of 15 to 25 million representing a trough EBITDA capacity for the business. I guess, how does that commentary change as we flash forward to today uh, with updated macro and also incorporating the expense reductions that you called out? Thanks. Yeah, hey, good morning, Ryan. Thanks. Um, so you're right. So, so, you know, last quarter we were sort of alluding to what would what we would expect to be quote unquote normalized kind of trough earnings in that 15 to 20 million of, of EBITDA per quarter. Um, obviously, we were doing that in the context of, of the brand spend that was weighing on the Q3 results. Um, you know, in, in the fourth quarter, look, there, there obviously is typical seasonality that, that's weighing on the results, and, and we would expect kind of the seasonal patterns to alleviate as we step into into Q1. Um, a couple of things, right? We've got the um, the expense reductions. We're not really getting a great deal of benefit from those in in Q4. Um, you know, the, the terminations took place uh, effective November 1, um, and so we'll, we'll get two months of benefit there on salaries, but actually the um, uh, expenses associated with employee benefits will roll through the month of November, and, and so we're picking up about a million and a half of, of benefit in Q4. That will obviously be a much bigger number as we head into Q1. Um, so, you know, kind of stepping back from that, we, we do feel like as we, as we get into next year, um, feel very good about sort of that 15 to $20 million floor. Got it. Thanks. And then in terms of competition, I think, you, you know, in, in your prepared remarks and the shareholder letter you called out in the consumer segment um, around competitive uh, dynamics there, I was hoping you can elaborate that on, on that a bit. Um, we've seen some conflicting headlines recently from some of your competitors in that category, um, you know, reportedly a hiring freeze from one, um, and then another, from another, a strong quarter and outlook. Um, you know, is that competitive pressure coming from the same places it has been historically, or are there any other changes in that landscape that you'd call out for the consumer segment? Thanks. Sure. Hey, Ryan, it's JD. I'll take that one. Um, when we refer to competitive pressure, typically what we're referring to is is uh, paid search. So on the cost side of the equation, not necessarily going to our partners, but rather um, competitors in certain of our businesses, Name, namely credit card, where we are more dependent than we would like to be on paid search. And so we've been pretty candid about the fact that in card, we need to evolve our business to, to reduce that dependence. TreeQual is part of that, right, because there we'll get the benefit of our My Lending Tree business as well as some of our other funnels, but it takes time to evolve that. In the interim, we're not getting as much benefit from increased card spend from card issuers because we're having to pay an awful lot to get traffic to them, right, and to meet certain volume quotas, et cetera. So that's, that's what we mean when we refer to competitive pressure. Um, there's a little bit of that in personal loans. Obviously, that's been a good business for everybody this year. And so there's competitive pressure there, but it's not nearly as acute because we have a more profound, a more um, a better marketing mix in that business. Uh, but it's, it's predominantly in credit card where we're just not benefiting quite as much as as a couple of our competitors there. Okay, thanks for clarifying and, to, and for taking the questions. Sure. Thank you, Ryan. Our next question is going to come from Jet Kelly of Oppenheimer and Company. Uh, Jet, please proceed with your question. Hey, great. Um, um, th thanks for taking my question. Um, just, just two, if I may, just, just circling back around credit cards. Um, you know, you, you, you did call out the, the competition and paid search. Um, but are there any, you know, site improvements or, or something you're doing to, to drive engagement? I'm sure my lending tree is a, a big component of that, and then. Can you give us an update with credit cards or on, on how prequal is trending with some of the larger issuers? Thanks. Yeah, I'll just uh, start with that and just I'll highlight the tree qual and then hand it off to JD. Um, 
Trequal is really um, is a is a component, as JD said, of uh, of our of getting credit card right. If you if you think of every one of our businesses as a two sided marketplace, you have customer acquisition, then you have monetization on the other side. Um, the on the monetization side, the the click out model um, <clears throat> is something that we want to improve over time on both uh, uh, for credit card. Uh, because it gives the consumer a better experience, and there's a lot of leakage in approval rates that uh, JD can talk more about. So once we are you know, tied in more directly with the underwriting of of the lenders, um, you know, you can you can plug that approval rate leak. JD, you want to take it from there? Sure. Um, in terms of the experience, uh, one of our you know, not the, uh, not the most exciting thing to talk about externally, but one of our platform migrations for next year that will be in Q1 and Q2 of next year will, will profoundly impact credit card in a very positive way with respect to site reliability, speed, and ability to cha- make changes. Um, and so that should benefit that business. Now, um, keep in mind, in, in credit card, we go to market as compare cards, um, and that's something that's under evaluation as well. How do we, how do we migrate and get the benefit of the lending tree brand for the credit card business. So those are two two things beyond TreeQual. But stepping back from from it with, you know, credit card is probably the business that needs that the most. But just understanding the strategy behind TreeQual, because it really resonates across all of our businesses, which is better authenticating who that con- who that consumer is for our partner, right? And if you look at our personal loan business where somebody fills out a form and we are able to better filter that consumer for our personal loan partners, that is in part an authenticated consumer. In the case of TreeQual, we're going a step further beyond just a form and filtering to essentially pre-qualify somebody. So it's a big step forward for our businesses, but the one that will benefit the most will be credit card because it's operating from a base where we don't really collect very much information on the consumer at all. It's just a true click-out business. So just strategically, when you hear us talk about TreeQual, that is what we're talking about. We're talking about delivering more value for our partners. Um, Now, as it relates to where we are, um, we now have four partners in card and one in personal loan. The personal loan rollout will be a little bit um, more deliberate than it will be in card. The dialogue with card issuers has expanded quite a bit in the third quarter. We have some who want to um, integrate with us before the end of the year, which is great. Not all of them want to work in the tree qual fashion that we've talked about. Some want to do direct APIs with us, which is which is great. We welcome that as well. Uh, but the receptivity to a more authenticated consumer, we're very confident in, or we're very happy with, I should say. And while it has been bumpy throughout the year because we have a lot of third-party dependencies, and as you would imagine, given the shifting shifting budgets of card issuers and, um, you know, throughout the year with views on the economy, getting partners to spend money on an integration is challenging. We feel really good about the momentum with card issuers, and that list is long. And I think we're having a different conversation this time next year. And I, I hope that we have a very different credit card business this time next year, one where we're genuinely delivering the right consumer for the right card. Thank you. Um, and just, just one more, just on the brand spend, um, you know, how would we see that start to show up in the financials um, where you're getting the benefit? So yeah. uh, I'll just yeah, – I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll take that and oh, – sorry, Trent. Um, let me just – start more broadly. So you'll see it in what we call, well, so whenever you run a, a TV campaign, you run what's, uh, you you are monitoring what's known as your return on ad spend or your ROAS. Um, and um, and that is in the numbers. It's obviously not one-to-one and the, and the revenue comes in over time. Um, but we're very, very pleased with where that is, uh, with where we turned out. There was actually one of our most successful campaigns we've ever run in terms of of improving brand metrics. Um, and then you see it over time as you continue to run, you see it in your multi-touch attribution as it helps your other channels. And we definitely did see that as, uh, as well. And um, so I'm really pleased with how the brand campaign went. And the other thing I would say is it, 
It also came along with one of our initiatives was Marketplace 24 and uh, came with a, a revamp of our forms and customer experience as well. Um, and so uh, I feel really good about where the brand went. Trent, some numbers? Yeah, Doug, I, thank you. you. You hit a lot of what I was going to get at. I was just going to say, um, you know, just from a, from a financial standpoint, we've, um, we've not yet made a determination as to how much or, or the timing of, of brand investments headed into next year. Uh, I'm sure that's a, that's a logical follow-on question. So more to come on, on that front. But as Doug said, we're, we're pleased with the, with the early reads. We've seen tangible signs of improvement in several of the brand health metrics, things like awareness, consideration, um, impression. Um, and, it, and, you know, we're going to continue to unpack kind of the results of it and, and formulate our plans for next year. Thank you. And the only other thing I'd add is, like, is when we're running TV, um, we're, we're pretty confident in the health of the underlying business, um, you know, because that, that does take a while to pay off and um, can be fairly risky. Um, however, at the same time, you know, we, we love that our business model can actually support a you know, limited TV spend. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Jed. Uh, next up, we are going to have a question from John Campbell of Stevens Incorporated. Uh, John, go ahead and ask your question. Hey, guys. Good morning. Good morning, John. Good morning, John. Hey, John. Hey, uh, you know, clearly industry refi, you, I mean, we're going to be at a trough for, for a period of time here. I'm, I'm just curious about how you guys are thinking about your quarterly or annually, just however you want to frame it up, but your personal kind of trough level of refi revenue. And then separately, if you guys can maybe talk to your lender partners, um, you know, the, you know, specifically those guys that, that have been, you know, historically uh, like, pre, you know, pure refi shops, could you talk to how they're kind of embracing this new norm and whether they're closing shop or if they're looking to maybe lean on you guys to, to pivot to the purchase market? Or, um, John, I'll take it. It's JD. Um, one, historically, you've heard us talk about that shift from refi to purchase, and that is absolutely going on. The difficulty here in the second half of 22 is obviously with purchase inventory, well, you've got two headwinds, right? First, it was purchase inventory and time to close. Purchase, as we've talked about, for those loan officers is more challenging than refi. Um, the second headwind is obviously just rising rates. And so you've seen a lot of macro data on declining purchase volumes. And if you look at the MBA data, this is always a tricky time of year as we look out to 23 at the MBA data because the um, the forecast obviously just changed quite a bit. They just took down their forecast for for overall purchase and, and refi for next year as well. So so that's tricky. Now what's different this year is that many of our lenders would typically who who are refi in intent would be buying home equity leads and trying to convert those um, borrowers who are expressing an intent around home equity into cash out refi. What is a little bit different this year is that we've seen a genuine expansion of the home equity product. And so home equity is one of our best performing products within the home segment. Um, and it has replaced that shift to purchase. And it's actually bigger than purchase at this point uh, for us. So that's great. Now we're mindful of the fact that we still don't have all of those lenders with a legitimate home equity product, right? There are still some trying to convert to cash out refi, but it's a much healthier business than it was, uh, than it has been in the past. And so um, that's, that's kind of what's different. Now, as it relates to refi, what we struggle with a bit is we look at the same stats that you do, which talk about the number of Americans who would benefit from a refinance at this point. And that pool is obviously historically small. Um, but there is still a projected amount of refinance that will occur next year. And so from an operating perspective, our goal is to find ways to reduce our cost of acquisition and deliver for those partners. So we are at the point in the cycle where our ability to acquire should improve. There should be less competition. We're seeing signs of that happening now. And what we've got to do is for that base of refi that is projected to occur and that seems to occur every year despite 
uh, you know, despite rising rates, we've got to deliver for our partners there. Now, the other thing that you would ask is, what are our lender um, lender partners doing? Well, one of the things we monitor is reductions in workforce among loan officers, right? And so we monitor that on a regular basis, and we and we've seen a fair amount of that, as you might imagine. And so we um, we have to monitor that. And we have to work with our lenders to make sure that that the loan officers that they've retained are productive. And so uh, this is kind of the period where we know that those lenders reduce the number of lead sources that they buy from, right? Their list gets a whole lot shorter, and we're happy when we're the retained partner. And then we try to make it as valuable for them as possible. The only difference relative to previous cycles is home equity is far more substantive. And, and as we look at the business go forward, when, when rates just stabilize, right, we think it should be a healthier business that's not just a function of one product in refi, but three products, refi, purchase, and home equity. Okay, that's a very helpful uh, thorough answer. I appreciate that, J.D. Um, one more on insurance. Um, I mean, clearly, you guys have to go through the planning and stuff uh, for, for, for the guide or for the 23 outlook for insurance. Uh, happy to take anything you want to provide there, but uh, just maybe broadly, if you could talk to just the conversations with carriers. I mean, I, I just feel like that's, that that business is primed to move as soon as things kind of normalize in the channel, however long that might be. Uh, and then also, if you could maybe just talk to the, the, the competition out there and the kind of calls to acquire. Yeah, I just thought I'll, I'll take that question. Um, just just starting with, with the long-term outlook, yeah, at a high level, the carriers. I mean, there was there's been growing optimism uh, in the second half of the year that that a their rates are catching up. Some carriers feel that the rates are already in a good spot. A number of carriers feel like they're catching up to the inflation, and, and it just a one or two additional rate increase cycles will get them at, ahead of the inflation. I've heard from a number of carriers that they. Their feelings starting at the beginning of the year, they, they have their own auto insurance inflation index that look at things like price of used cars, cost to repair cars, time to repair cars, et cetera. And I feel like a number of them are feeling that that's going to start to lower at the end of this year, beginning of next year. And so then the rate increases are going to quickly start surpassing that to get them back into a good position. So cautiously optimistic and, 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 and what I like to say is, is bold and italicized the cautiously word there you know I, th- I think we'll start to see momentum starting uh, at the beginning of next year but it's not going to be right back to normal the, the good old days at the very beginning but it will start to build and like you even mentioned on the question I think it will snowball as it starts to build and, and, and competition for consumers that they're, everyone expects to be have a lot of Consumer shopping in market next year, um, and then and then on the on the other side about just the competitors and the cost of acquisition, um, you know I think all of us are taking our own different tax. On, on I can just speak specifically to the insurance side on Lending Tree. You know our tax with subdued client budget is just to a focus on margins and BMD and B focus on quality. And so what we really did, working closely with our clients, we're not trying to force too much traffic to them right now. We're just focusing on the highest quality traffic, um, highest intent traffic. For example, our search traffic is up 72% year over year, Q3 compared to Q3 last year. Um, and, and we've been controlling and subduing some of the less high intent traffic, which allows us to monitor, you know, as monetize as much as possible in today's time, the current traffic, which which I feel has put us in a good position to get, you know, when those budgets start coming back, to get a big piece of the buy as as the highest intent traffic is going to be the first thing that the carriers want. Makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Scott. Yep. Thank you, John. And up next for questions, we are going to have Rob Wildhack out of Autonomous. Rob? Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yep. 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 Great. Great. Thanks. I uh, wanted to ask you about uh, cash generation and, and the free cash flow that you uh, you generate, or your, excuse me, that you reference the shareholder. Um, year-to-date, 
CapEx is down about 70% year over year. So can you talk about how in an environment that's as difficult as this one from a macro and a competitive perspective, you're ensuring that you're investing enough while also balancing that against cash generation and free cash flow? Uh, Yeah, I'll start with that. Um, Yeah, in terms of investments, um, we have what we what we did last year or this, this year is uh, we had a very focused set of key strategic growth initiatives. Obviously, we're an OKR company as well, so uh, people have initiatives below that. And um, by having that level of focus, um, you know that's enabled us to uh, you know keep a lid on um, on um, on soft a lot of that capitalization is probably software trying to tell me if that's uh, if that's not the case but uh, i think it's because we've got a focused list of a few things that we think can move the needle and um and we're beavering on them this year and hope to you know probably still do some beavering next year but that's really that's really why it's really uh, just staying focused and um you know we've never been a company that um you know overspends um you know without uh, discipline on the on the revenue side, and um, and I think that's why you're seeing it over this company's history. Trent, anything else? Yeah, Rob, I just had uh, yeah, I'd, I'd just point out that you know you you noted the capex was down considerably year on year. Recognized that um, throughout 2020 and 2021, we had a lot of capex related to um, to our new headquarters build out, right? And so it's it sort of reverted back to. Yeah, yeah. The great normal point. levels with the completion of that with the completion of that project um so from look, from a cash flow standpoint um you know our our adjusted EBITDA to free cash flow conversion is is pretty high I mean that's a pretty good measure and then obviously we've got um about a 20 million dollar annualized interest burden that we're you know that we're mindful of that that's certainly not problematic but um for better or worse I mean the the, the model is one that still continues to generate pretty good cash flow quarter to quarter, despite what we're dealing with on the macro level. Okay. Um, and then to stick with cash, you've, you've run the business at times with more cash than the 286 that you have now, at times with a lot less cash too. So how much of the, the 286 million cash today would you bucket as, as you know, quote unquote, run the business type cash? Yeah, we, we conservatively, conservatively, we need about, you know, 75 million of cash to run the business. So certainly there's, you know, there is excess cash on the balance sheet. We're looking for ways to deploy that. Obviously, we've got to be mindful of kind of where our leverage levels have gone, given the, you know, given the current EBITDA profile that we're that we're dealing with. Um, so so we continue to evaluate options, whether it's tuck in M&A or, um, you know, potentially uh, delevering, um, but given sort of current current macro conditions and uncertainty about near-term macro conditions, um, you know, holding on to that cash is is um, you know we we feel like it's a pretty good idea to to sit on that cash and and sort of see ourselves through this this near-term uncertainty. Got it. If I could just sneak one more in, could you just remind us what the uh, the leverage uh, covenant is? So our our credit agreement is governed by a broader secured net leverage test, um, and so it's two and a half times secured net leverage. Um, obviously, the only portion of our debt that's secured is the term loan that we did last fall. That's only two hundred fifty million. So from a from a secured net leverage test, we're in a net cash position. So, so that's a very little concern. Very helpful. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thank Rob. You, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Our next question is going to come from Melissa Waddell from J.P. Morgan. Melissa, you have the line. Thanks very much. Appreciate you taking my questions today. I was hoping we could go back to insurance for a moment. Um, follow-up question for Scott. I heard what you said about expecting to see a bit of progress early in 23, but without ramping um, throughout the year. Would you expect a similar cadence on margin or something else? Yeah, hi, Melissa. This is Scott. I, you know, I, well, I would say for starters, um, we've already started 
the margin profile adjustments, and we're, and we're very focused on – we were, I think, as uh, Doug or Andrew mentioned earlier in the call, we're up four and a half points from Q2 to Q3. We're going to be up in a two points in from Q3 to Q4. Uh, so we're feeling really good about the trajectory of our margins. Again, like as I said in my previous answer, just – Instead of focusing on trying to deliver anything and everything to the clients, just focusing on delivering the highest quality, which is what the clients want right now, and making the most monetization out of that limited traffic uh, instead of trying to overwhelm a client with traffic. And so I think that puts us in a very good margin profile when the growth starts. And so then the goal is just to maintain that margin profile as we get the revenue growth. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, and then I, I had a follow-up question on a comment. I think it was in the shareholder letter about there being sort of record consumer search activity within insurance. Wanted to make sure I'm understanding that uh, correctly. Are you guys looking at that as sort of um, just a rational consumer response to auto rates that have been increasing, or is there something bigger to read into that in terms of sort of like pent-up demand for auto? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if that reference was in our letter or somewhere else, but I, that is a phenomenon. That oh, that is oh, yeah, oh yes, okay. So the, uh, the, yes, that is a phenomenon that's happening right now, and it is a I would say more so than pent up demand. I mean, auto insurance is something that consumers are always shopping for. I think it's more of a rational consumer response to raising rates. I mean, people are getting the renewal notices right now, and there's the shock value when you see a 10 or 15 percent rate increase. Um, because all the carriers are putting through rate increases to try to catch up with inflation. So that just drives shopping behavior. Um, so, so at the end of the day, everyone's putting rate increases in, but it incentivizes people to shop, uh, w which is a good thing for a company like ours. Got it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Melissa. Our next question is going to come from Christopher Kennedy of William Blair. Christopher, you have the line. Hi, this is uh, Mark on from for Chris. I uh, just wanted to ask one question here. Saw that my lending tree users grew during the quarter, but obviously the revenue contribution from my lending tree went down 25%. Uh, I mean, historically, you've talked about a lot of the revenue from my lending tree coming from personal loans. So wanted to see if you could talk about any of that di dynamic there between my lending tree user growth and then revenue contribution. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, in, invariably what happens with our um, – with that base, and as we've talked about, that, that base disproportionately benefits our personal loan business. And while that business remains strong, recognize that in the third quarter, what we saw among our lenders was more tightening of filters with concern about the economy, right? So they moved up with respect to – up with respect to um, credit quality – and they were also increasing pricing to the borrower, right? So that's the behavior of the personal loan. Now, that that exists in our marketplace business, but recognize that what's happening is the um, the My Lending Tree base is being filtered that much more relative to those tightened filters. So you saw a deceleration effectively in um, – that, that engagement because of the in, because of the tightened filters and the increased pricing from our lenders. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is the number two product for the My Lending Tree base in any given quarter has historically been refi. So you're seeing you're seeing the impact of that as well. Um, and so it's always an interesting thing to look at alignment between that My Lending Tree base and and revenue in a given quarter. Operationally, we tend to focus more on are we growing the base, are we diversifying the base, um, but there are some read-throughs in a given quarter that, you know, are, are probably a little bit short-term oriented. Um, so, essentially, we think it's, it's, it's related to the PL tightening and, and to refi and, and not, much more, not much more of a read-through than that. Got it. Thank you. Then, I guess, kind of following up, uh, 
with the tree qual initiative, have you guys thought about any additional product types to expand tree qual into or kind of focus right now on where it's at with personal loans and credit cards? Uh, I'm going to let JD pick up on that one, but uh, in some of our other products, um, for example, mortgage, you're already tied into um, uh, pricing engines. Um, so JD, take it from there. Yeah, I, I think, as I said before, the business that will benefit the most initially will be credit card. We want to get that right first. Um, personal loan, what we're seeing is a real overlap. You're starting to see, we've seen real growth in the, the base of lenders in personal loans. We also see a trend where many of our personal loan lenders are getting into credit cards, growing a credit card business um, as well. So it's a natural extension, but honestly, the the focus for TreeQual for the next year will continue to be on those two products. The thing that TreeQual enables us to do that is really interesting is it's not just going to be dependent on the My Lending Tree base. So you could envision a scenario where a consumer in our personal loan marketplace is looking for a personal loan that is perhaps inefficient. Maybe it's a small dollar size. They're looking for an $8,000 personal loan, and the pricing for that loan is inefficient for them. And we can offer them a credit card in the experience. So think of like an interstitial that would show up in that experience and say, hey, have you considered this? And so it gives, us, it gives us the ability to be way more dynamic and responsive to the consumer's need, and that's where this will evolve. So we'd rather really get it right in cards and personal loans um, and then we'll figure out whether it can apply to other products. But that's the first leverage point. Got it. Thank you guys for taking my questions. All right. Uh, our next question, oops, pardon me. And the next question is now going to come from Yusuf Squally of Truist Securities. Uh, Yusuf? Hi. Good morning, guys. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Yusuf. Yes. Hey, Yusuf. Good morning. Excellent. Good morning. So I, I, I apologize, uh, I joined late, so this question may, may, may have been asked, but just on the credit card business down 10%, um, maybe can you just exp uh, expand on what went on there? One of your peers uh, that also reported last night showed quite a different um, uh, picture on, on that segment of the business, just trying to understand kind of maybe the competitive dynamics versus things that you um, have done that may have caused kind of a, uh, that kind yeah. of a decline, what's baked into your your kind of outlook for Q4 as far as credit card is concerned? Can I have a follow-up? Sure. So, Yusuf, we've talked about the fact that the thing that we need to improve in our credit card business is our marketing mix, right? We're very dependent on paid search. And so, um, in that respect, when we get budget from an issuer, we've got to go out and go acquire traffic. And so that, that traffic has been expensive. And as a strategy for our card business, you know, we've got to improve that over time. We've got to, we've got to improve and find low cost sources of, of traffic. And so when you think about that, you typically think about what is organic or near organic. So content, which takes a long time, right? You have to develop SEO content and it takes a long time to get there. So the competitor that you're mentioning is a, is a known player. Their primary strategy is SEO, and what we've observed in the quarter is two things. One, they obviously talked about an acquisition, but two, they have stacked more what I would call card sort on top of their organic or editorial content. So if you go into a Google search and you see what was previously a um, quote-unquote editorial content around cards, it is way more transactional than it was a quarter ago, um, and, and it has – a, an array of cards that are available to you, et cetera. So that is a strategy that they're benefiting from in the quarter, um, and, they're, and they're better leveraging their SEO content. Now, as you know, the SEO business is an important business, but one that you have to manage the, the quality of the content over time. Uh, it's important to us to grow that and have it be part of our marketing mix for sure, um, but it's something where our card business simply does not benefit as much from it as we would like it to. Um, and that's really the distinction in the quarter in the card business. So while we, we definitely have payouts that are higher than they were a year ago, now keep in mind, payouts tend to be peaking in the third quarter. So they were, they were healthy a year ago as well. 
The difference is that we're just having to pay an awful lot to go get that traffic, and uh, and so that's been the challenge. And then in terms of what's uh, baked into your your Q4 outlook, uh, we don't we are in our Q4 outlook. We continue to assume we we the only thing that's baked in is the seasonality of Q4. We don't assume that that improves at all uh, in CART. And is is SEO something that you guys are going to lean much more aggressively into? Because you've always had a little bit, but not a lot of it, and that was by design. Does this kind of – Yeah, we've actually seen – yeah. It's interesting, Yusuf. Across our business, SEO, and, you know, credit to the team, the results this year are actually quite good in in many of our verticals. It's just recognized that we're trying to support many verticals. Uh, with improved SEO performance and 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 not we're not as concentrated. All right, we 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 do have SEO has to support home, SEO has to support personal loan, right? Insurance, and so um, in that respect, you're just not seeing as direct of a benefit as somebody who's more focused on the card business specifically. Yeah, and the, the only thing I'd add is. Um, uh, you target your SEO and your content, which we, and we've got teams, great teams doing that at your highest, you know, uh, at your highest value products. And ours have been tilting, you know, obviously not as much credit card than, than, uh, than our competitor. And um, the only other thing I'd add is in a paid marketing business, while that sometimes, you know, can obviously free traffic is better, but the challenge with free traffic is it doesn't double and triple like you can when you can lean into paid marketing. And um, so I think our paid marketing capability is very, very good. And as JD said, you know, uh, we need to step up on the content game. And the nice thing there is, you know, if somebody else has, has uh, has another trick, we can do it too. And we think the Lending Tree brand will pull better than pretty much anybody at the end of the day. That's great. That's helpful. And maybe just one uh, question on profitability. So, I know you've you've gone through some cost cutting. As as you look at longer term profitability, um, I guess how, how do you balance out um, profitability derived from just top line growth, which arguably is kind of hard to control, versus just profitability from better cost containment, which you guys seem to be doing. I guess what I'm asking is, it looks like profitability is probably troughing in Q three, but as we look beyond Q3, Q4 into next year. I mean, how long before we get back to double-digit kind of EBITDA margins at least? Someone, what you're seeing today? Yeah, we we talked about this a little bit earlier as well, Yusuf. Um, You know, last quarter, we we sort of mentioned a you know kind of a 15 to 20 million dollar trough EBITDA level. Um, You know, in in a quote unquote more normalized environment. Obviously, the you know the the macro conditions have continued to get worse. Um, Q4 is always seasonally a tough quarter. Um, Q3 was impacted by um, you know, kind of the, the upfront nature of the brand investment. And so, you know, as we said earlier, we still feel really good about that 15 to, to 20% or 15 to $20 million floor on a quarterly EBITDA basis going into next year. Um, obviously, we're going to continue to to push and manage the business to try to, try to do better than that. Um, you know, I guess uh, two things in terms of just balancing revenue opportunity and, and, and cost cutting. Um, you know, the macro conditions have been tough, and, and we're responding accordingly. Uh, accordingly, we're weathering this this tough environment where we've got a you know, um, for us, our mix of business being sort of anchored in in home and insurance, um, 
those two in particular are experiencing tough headwinds, and I think we're being disproportionately impacted by those headwinds relative to some of our competitors. Uh, and so we're, you know, we're navigating through this environment. Um, we're going to continue to, to manage the cost structure with discipline, um, but we're, we're certainly still well enough resourced to continue to execute on our strategy and, and drive growth in the quarters and years ahead. The only thing, used, if I'd add to it, is, and Scott alluded to this in terms of his margin profile, right, recognize the insurance business started to see um, constrained budgets, you know, call it in the second half of last year, and now Scott and team have done a great job of managing margin in their business, VMM, right, in their business, by, by so they're delivering higher quality for their partners at a lower cost driving our margins higher with better quality delivered, right? And now in the home business, we need to do the same thing. When you see that revenue deceleration, what you would typically see is our margins would expand a bit because we're not chasing every last bit of traffic because our partners only want the best traffic. And so we've got to do that in the home business. The only business we have that is not operating at you know, a margin that we're happy with right now and among the big businesses is cars. Right, and so we've got to manage it in the businesses on a VMM level, and then we've got to manage our OPEX, which obviously Trent mentioned the work that we did in the quarter, which we should all emphasize will be ongoing, right, um, is to reduce that OPEX and deliver margin. That is absolutely part of our strategy as we move forward in 23. That's helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Yusuf. As a reminder, if you do have a question, please press star one one in your telephone and follow the prompt. Uh, next question is going to come from Mike Grandal of Northland Securities. Mike, you have this. Mike. <laughs> yeah. Hey guys. Um, Hi there. Mike. So my question is just about mortgage. Um, any thoughts on evolving or improving the customer experience? kind of with mortgage during this, you know, very slow period. How are you thinking about evolving that customer experience? Uh, so I, I referred in my, uh, in, in one of the questions uh, to Marketplace 24, the first phase of that project uh, was the revamp of the, uh, the the customer journey um, through the point of submitting a form on the marketplace. Uh, the second version of that we're working on right now, which is to um, improve the CRM, uh, if you will, between the time that a customer clicks submit and the time that they close. Uh, what we think that will do is move up the lender's close rates. As their close rates go up, their cost per funded loan goes down, and then they increase their bids. And uh, we're uh, we're working on some really interesting ways of sharing data back and forth between us and lenders, uh, so that we can use that data um, over the long purchase cycle over the long purchase cycle of a mortgage. When you think about a mortgage, it's a highly considered purchase. It's not something that you buy in one click on a website right away. You want to go talk to your spouse. You want to go shop around, and you need to manage that customer. And we need to. Uh, give them confidence all the way through the uh, the process of selecting a lender um, and locking in, and uh, and that's the focus of uh, of that, um, you know. And we're we're just kicking that off, um, but uh, but that that's a really big focus there. Okay. Hey, thanks for that color. Thank you, Mike. And our last call question comes from Jamie Friedman of. Uh, Susquehanna International Group. Hi. Um, so just to uh, revisit some of the prior comments, so I'm hearing you right, with regard to the margin, um, I, I, I don't want to mess this up, but I think you said, I think um, you said, Trent, in, your, in a previous answer that you were still comfortable that the margin same mid-cycle can return to the, say, mid to high teens that they've been historically? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that about right? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I, I said that specifically. I think what we said was um, sort of continuing some commentary from last quarter. Uh, you know, as we get into next year, despite 
any improvement in the macro and, and perhaps even allowing for some degradation in the macro, um, we still feel pretty comfortable that um, we can deliver kind of a 15 to $20 million floor with regard to um, quarterly EBITDA. Yep, okay. And, you know, historically, um, that's been significantly influenced by the relative margin characteristics of the different business segments. So is there any underlying assumption there, or is that just because of kind of cost improvements in the overall corporate structure? Uh, both. I mean, as we've said, you know, we're we're – very focused on both preserving the kind of the gross margin within each business. Um, yep. You know, in an environment where the revenue opportunity is is challenged or limited, um, we're maniacally focused on preserving as much margin within that as we can. Um, and then, and then the, you know, the opex piece is, is a is a different different animal. But we're yep. we're obviously very intently focused on that as we head into next year. I mean, clearly we've, we've taken some steps throughout this year. Um, we did a, a workforce reduction in January. We've we've done another one here just last week, um, and, and we'll continue to kind of evaluate that as we as we head into next year. Yeah, and let me just uh, make make a clarification, too. When, when Trent expresses confidence in, you know, normalized EBITDA, the reason we can do that as a company is that the – is that we're basically always balancing supply and demand in our in the core of the business model. So if insurance companies, for example, are demanding fewer customers, fewer leads, um, we go turn down the marketing spigot, and you still make EBITDA, you still make VMM, you just make less of it. Um, the flip side is when people increase their demand for personal loans, those bids go up, or if the conversion rates go up, your monetization goes up, and then you can go market into that and increase the supply of leads into the market. So as you, in either one of, because the marketing costs and the revenue are joined at the hip, um, the margin percentage roughly goes up and down. And, and as long as there's enough demand in the system for insurance companies, for mortgage companies and banks to actually work with us, um, then you go, then you have enough VMM, and then you go look at your uh, fixed cost structure. And except for your growth initiatives, you know, there's, you know, you you beaver away at that, as Trent has already talked about. Got it. Thanks for that, Doug. Great. Thank you, James, and thank you, everyone, for your questions. Uh, at this time, I would like to turn it back to the speakers for any closing remarks. Um, thank you very much, and thank you again all for uh, being here. Um, I, I sort of alluded this in my last answer, but given the diversification of the model, uh, the way the marketplace works, um, we are absolutely thrilled that uh, we've been able to execute the past several years in a really, really, really choppy market. And when we talk about supply and demand, keep in, in that context, demand for all of our leads, if you will, across segments have been, uh, have been down. Uh, and uh, we've been able to, uh, not only the business model is resilient, but our team has been fantastic at seeking out opportunities. JD referred earlier to the fact that when lenders do pull back as they reduce demand, we love the fact that in most instances we're the last uh, we're the last uh, place standing uh, as a marketing partner. The next thing I just want to highlight is managing costs. Trent already hit on this. That's really important to to do as a company. It is not lost on us, and uh, and we are going to contribute. Every dollar we spend is going uh, is going to the right place. Um, and then after that, what we do is I believe very, very strongly in our core set of growth initiatives and what they're going to do for our company. And uh, they won't all work, um, but I bet we're going to have a couple hits in there. I want to thank you all, uh, shareholders, for uh, being with us. Uh, I hope we were giving you great transparency. And stay tuned because you haven't heard you, – there's a lot more to hear from Lending Tree coming up. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your participation in today's conference. This does conclude the program, and you may now disconnect.